Okay, the biblical truth of our hymns, 65, has a very sad story. To William Cooper, there is a fountain. And when you look at the history of these hymns, and this one stands in awe. Let me just read to you. So in 1763, this is about Cooper, was offered a clerkship journals of the House of Lords but broke under the strain of approaching examination. He experienced a period of depression and insanity. At this time, he tried three times to commit suicide and was sent to Nathan L. Cotton's asylum. After being institutionalized for insanity, Copper found refuge in a fervent evangelical Christianity. He continued to suffer doubt and after a dream in 1773, where he believed was doomed to eternal damnation. He recovered and wrote more religious hymns. In 1773, Cooper experienced an attack of insanity. Imagine not only that he was going to be condemned to hell, but that God was con commanding him to make a sacrifice of his own life. I mean, he, he's saying that God told him to kill himself. He met John Newton, a former captain of slave ships, who had to devote his life to the gospel. Newton invited Copper to contribute to a hymn book that he was compiling. As a result, in volume known as Online Hymns, O L N E Y, was not published in 1779, but includes hymns such as Praise for the Fountain Open. Uh, this is where this is, this is our, there is a fountain. So it was once called Praise for the Fountain Open. William Cooper, pronounced Cooper, was one of the few hymn writers that was also a recognized secular poet. He was much beloved and tormented literary figure, was born in his father's rectory at Great Birkenhipstead, England, the Church of St. Peter, November 26, 70, 1731. And I got something else here I want to read here about this hymn. An, excess, and an unsuccessful major altercation, 1819, and this was written about 1772, sought to make the hymn, this hymn we're looking at, There's a Fountain, less graphic by changing the first line to, from Calvary's cross, a fountain flows. Hymnologist E.E. E. Ryder says that this alter alteration forgets that there were, the offensive graphic language expressed is not only poetry, but the poetry of intense and passionate feeling which naturally embodies itself in the boldest metaphor. In the second alteration, in stanza two, where Cooper or Cooper writes, the dying thief rejoices to see that fountain in his day. And there have I, there have I, as vile as he, washed all my sins away. Now here's what it, the last two lines was altered. And there are many sinners, vile as he, washed all my guilt away. Oh, look at that. They took sin out. They took sin out. And were many, vile as he. They had took away the I, changed I to sinners, and then changed sin to guilt. So why have a song or a hymn recognize me as a sinner? And later there was another alteration. There and there would there would I, though vile is he, wash all my sins away. And finally it was common to use the hymnals today, and there may I, though vile is he, wash all my sins away. And that's what we have here. And this is <laughs> And original, the dying thief rejoices to see the fountain in his day. And there have I, as vile as he, washed all my sins away. The dying thief rejoices to see the fountain of his day. And there may I, okay, it's been changed. He says, and there have I, though vile as he, and he has as vile as he, Washed all my sins away. Washed all my sins away. So here's a guy in depression and anxiety. 
who believed that God was going, you know, told him to go kill yourself. And if he's writing in the first person of himself and true to his heart, and I don't know. He says, the dying thief rejoiced the see that found in his day. And there may I, okay, let's look at the writer, William Coper. So violent, see, I, I'm worse than that, that, that dying thief. Washed all my sins away. So what are you going to say? I'm going to say by stanza number two. That Cooper was saved. And he just could not really embrace the fact and the security in God. And we see notes, I've seen things where he wrote secular work too. And he dealt with uh, Inlad and uh, something else. Uh, Kutna, um, what is it? What else did he deal with? And this did not to be there. Uh, one of those stupid writers. I can't. Let's see if I can just real find it real quick to give you the name. No, it's not important. Oh, I see something like that. I'm just looking right here. See if, I, if it names it, it names. It. If it don't, who cares? It's worldly. And I think if he would have stayed with the Lord instead of the other worldly work, I think maybe the God would give him true victory. But number sixty-five, there is a fountain. There is a fount filled with blood. Hey, he doesn't write water. He doesn't write church attendance. Drawn from Emmanuel's vein. Now, he, this hymn cannot be sung in a Jehovah Witness. Hall. Oh. Why not? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Matthew chapter 2. And God with us is Jesus. And Jehovah Witness sure don't believe that Jesus is God and God is Jesus. So we start off with the very first stanza of this hymn by this man, Cooper. God is Jesus and Jesus is God. And this heart, and this the hymn came truly from his heart. We're going to find Cooper all in glory and glory in heaven. And you can write a wonderful hymn as this and still have physical and and uh, spiritual troubles and problems with the mind. And and sinners plunge beneath that flood. What flood? The blood. The fount. That's able to wash and cleanse us. Lose all their guilty stains. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What do you say? Uh, listen, we're only in stanza one to five. When was the last time this hymn was sung in your church? It's got the gospel, it's got the blood, it's got salvation. And it says, lose all their guilty stains, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty... Man, he repeats it. It's a verily, verily. Verily, verily. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, the blood, lose all their guilty stains. I want to make sure. And I am not one for hymns that repeat over and over and over. But... If this hymn were to be sung in a church, you would walk out of church, hopefully, with this melody in this tune and the lyrics just singing in your heart by repetition. It's not repetition to, you know, just get your name in a, in a songbook somewhere. It's repetition. Just get it in the heart of a man that had troubles and problems with, with life. And it happens. The dying thief, we looked at this. What was the dying thief? He was a guilty thief that was crucified. He was guilty. Rejoice to see that fountain in his day. There he is standing, well not standing, but there he is on the cross next to Jesus. And Jesus' words to them, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And I, man, that just must have been anxiety for that dying thief. I'm going to see him. I'm going to see him more. I'm going to die. I'm going to see him. And Mr. Cooper says, and there may I, Cooper, though vile is he, 
the thief. Wash all my sins away. Now, with a hymn like this, and you got a congregation of, of people in the church going to sing, can you imagine a lost man singing, and there may I, as the Bible is he, wash all my sins away, and a guy's not saved? He's lost? And singing such a wonder, I can sing that stanza too, because I am vile. You wouldn't know how vile I am. You wouldn't even be listening to me if you knew how vile I was. But I am washed in the blood and my sins are cleansed. And you know, it's one thing God cannot do. He cannot remember my sins and your sins under the blood. Glory to God. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Get it. Repeat it. Announce it. And there may I, though vile is he, wash all my sins away. And this, and this hymn comes out of Zechariah 13, 1, if I didn't mention that. Dear dying lamb, capital L, the lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. Can I tell you that this hymn is loaded with scripture? Thy precious blood. Peter said uh, the, the sinless, the, the sinless blood of, of, of the Lamb, without spot, without sin. Acts twenty twenty eight says that blood is God's blood, shall no, never lose its power. I am going to live eternally before God the Father and Jesus Christ my Savior for all eternity because of the blood of Jesus. I'm never going to die, even before the rapture, if I go. Because if I die, the Bible says through the blood of Jesus Christ to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Actually, there's really no death. You just pass on to heaven by Jesus or you pass on to hell by anything else. This body may die. Till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Look at that. There's the rapture. Here's a guy, they, oh, you know, he's an insane psalm, and he's speaking about the blood of Jesus Christ. He's speaking about how vile he is, and he's saying, you know what the hope is? I, you know, my mind, I can't get my mind straight. I got troubles, I got anxieties, but you know what I got? I got the greatest hope of the rapture coming, and that body buried in the ground today. That body's still waiting for the resurrection when Jesus Christ shall blow that, that trump blow, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. No, look at this man. And there are sane people out there who are saved. They, they are right in their minds, and they're not living as great as this man in his hymn. I think I can lose it. I, 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 I don't know if, 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 if you know, I, I, can God really keep me? Can, can I really? I, I sin and God hit. This guy is looking to the rapture. To all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more. That's the rap. And then once we go to be in the clouds, dead or alive, that's it. No more sin. What a hope. What And Titus 2.13 says, the blessed hope. And the glorious period of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. To... Uh, uh, to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. You know what, Christian? There's coming a time that we're going to live and there'll be no more sin. You know that besetting sin that we have in our lives, whatever it is, we, that's it. You're going to get rid of that sin one day forever and go on there and forget it. Now, you may get some ashes. But after those ashes, no more again. No more again. To all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. What a what glorious God. Put this one in, put this in the hymnal for the church. And Paul says when he writes to the to the Thessalonians, comfort you, cover ye one another in what? In the rapture. And he says to him, Weep not as others weep, for they have no hope. But we got to, hey, listen, yeah, I know your, your mama, your, your dad, I, I know your, your wife, your husband, I know your children, I know your best friend, I know your pastors died in the Lord. But weep because you're going to miss them, but don't weep because there's no hope. There is hope. Ere since by faith, by faith, I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply. 
You mean from the hands, from the feet, and the side? Listen, that's the gospel. Jesus Christ suffered and died according to the scriptures. This man's preaching the gospel. This man's going out all the world now dead, and I'm speaking through him, through his end, and we're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's been dead. And he had a life that wasn't really in his mind, but look what his hymn is doing. It's speaking. And this comes out of the Methodist Church, and they wouldn't dare sing a hymn like this in the Methodist Church today, because, it, it, oh, it's so cruel, it's so wicked, it's so vile, it's so unclean. No, it's not. And it's even been tried to been altered, and maybe even altered. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. You mean, Without a real sound mind. My faith. My redeeming love. While I am living. Is in that fount of the blood of God. Through Jesus Christ. Who suffered and died. Who had the bleeding wounds. That I am vile. And my hope is in that fount of Jesus Christ. And shall be till I die, shall be till I die. Redeeming love of Jesus has been my theme and shall be till I die. Redeeming love for God so loved the world. We love him because he first loved us. And this him again comes from that heart. He had it. He, he secured it. It's just his mind. But his heart. Aren't you glad the Bible says with the heart man believes unto righteousness? Aren't you glad to believe in thy heart, the Lord Jesus Christ, and not the mind? You say, well, what about people going to nursing home or, you know, they've lost their mind? If they're saved and grounded in the heart of Jesus, you may lose your mind, but you don't lose your salvation. And I've heard some wonderful stories from, from a few people about People they knew, and man, they're saved. They used to sing hymns and all that, and you go visit them. They don't know who you are, but as soon as that piano spark up a hymn, they be singing the hymn. They may forget who their relatives are, but they don't forget Jesus. You know why? Because humanity and the world is in the brain. Christianity, Jesus, and God in the hymns are in the heart. You better well respect that the Bible when the Bible says the, when the Bible says the heart and not the brain. I don't think anywhere in the Bible says anything about the brain. And when it says thoughts and minds and ideas, it says of the heart. Your brain may go, but if your heart is given over to Jesus, and that, you know, listen, the heart is vile and wicked above all things, Jeremiah said, and Jesus says how the heart comes adultery and murders and crimes and, and sins and all that, but if that heart is given to the Lord, I believe they'll remember. When this poor, whispering, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, you know, I, I preach on the street and there are people that like it and there are many people that hate me. They will rejoice if the Lord tarries, my body gets buried in a grave somewhere. Because this tongue will not speak of Jesus no longer. That you can find those videos on the YouTube and SoundCloud. If I were to drop dead on the streets of Daytona Beach in the public ministry of preaching on the streets, Jesus Christ and the God, they would applaud. I know at least two, maybe three people where I preach would applaud that if my tongue would lie silent in the grave. Then in the, a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. When we get the glory, it'll be singing. Though I really don't believe through the scriptures that singing goes on now. The next time I really hear singing in the Bible and the glory is when the tribulation saints are raptured and they're up there singing the new song of the Lamb and the song of Moses. 
The choir director, the song leader in heaven is Lucifer, and he has been cast out to the, to the earth called the devil and Satan. And I don't think there's any singing go, going on in glory. And when the angels came at the birth of Jesus, Luke says they said they didn't sing. But that's a whole different story. But when we get to glory, there will be New Jerusalem. There will be chorus of holiness. The cherubim say, holy, holy, holy. They're not singing it. They're singing it. I mean, they're saying it. But oh, when, when the chorus speaks up, and we'll, they'll, the, the Jewish remnant will be singing of the song of Moses and the, song, the new song of the Lamb. Our tongues. All holiness tongues, without tiredness, without getting, you know, dry mouth, without making a joyful uh, noise. It won't be a noise in glory. I'll sing thy power to save, all glory. I'll sing thy power to save to Jesus Christ, the Lamb that's on the throne. We're not going to sing contemporary music. We're not going to sing uh, 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 hymns and songs in heaven that it could be directed to your girlfriend or your boyfriend. It's going to be to God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit for all eternity. We're not going to sing about man. We're going to sing about the man, Christ Jesus. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy powers to say. Now remember, Cooper, he had... He was writing hymns and poetries in Christianity, and he was also doing the world. He was about the world's work. He was about the, the, the God's work. But when we get to glory, there will be no secular. There will be no worldly. There will be no humanistic. There will be all holy glory to God and Jesus Christ, the Father and the Son, forever. I'm going to get this one an A+. And this one, this hymn should be spoken sometimes when we're going to sing, there is a, you know, are any of you out there, your mind's not all there? Before we sing this, let me tell you the story of Mr. Cooper. And as you hear the story of Mr. Cooper, and when we ring these wonderful five, I said bring, when we ring these wonderful five stanzas, if you sing out of your heart, this is a man who didn't have it all in his heart. This is a man who had troubles and problems, and yet he wrote this wonderful hymn. From insane asylum came There is a Fount. After he met uh, the writer of uh, Amazing Grace, John Newman. And then I read, even after that, he still had problems back and forth. So what about his problems? His heart was rooted and grounded in Jesus and nothing else. And whatever of the world and whatever he did, worldly and all that, it's going to be wood, hay, or stubble as all of us. But if somebody got saved by there is a fount, if somebody got convicted by there is a fount, when I just read to you, which would be, should be sung, gold, silver, precious stones, count to the man of Cooper, who really didn't have, have the security in the world, but man, he had security in salvation. And if you got problems in the world and you got troubles with your mind and you're not completely settled, that's okay. Because God can settle it. And let's see if I can find this, this hymn. I mean, this hymn. If I can find this verse real quick, Timothy. First Timothy or Second Timothy? Probably Second Timothy. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Maybe you got to get out of the world to get that. He was in the world. You got to confess your sins before the blood. And it could be the devil trying to stop you. It could be, you know, you don't want to really have all that faith. I don't know what it is. I, I, I am not a diagnosis of, uh, I don't know you. But I tell you, it's either got to be God, the devil, or yourself. And you got to reach out to God and say, God, why? And I don't mean, why are you doing this? But Lord God, why am I going? What can I give you the glory and honor, God, to get things right? 
And many people don't want to ask that because they're going to realize that it may be their their sin that they enjoy. Maybe their sin they're doing. Maybe the, de the devil's trying to get you to quit. Maybe God's chastising you. But even, and I don't want to rank on Cooper. I, I don't want to do it, but, you know, a guy who has had those problems that we read and still write this wonderful hymn, you can get over it. And the worst thing that comes to worst to be happy is the fact is you can die in the Lord with a unsound mind, not heart. And Mr. Cooper today ain't worried about any of those anxieties today. He ain't never going to go to a, 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 a sane asylum anymore. He's gone to a mansion. He'll be going to New Jerusalem. He is before God, the Father, the Creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ forever. <coughs> but I believe just by his hand, when the raptures happen, he'll be up there in the clouds. He'll be walking around the street of gold. And there are probably many, many Christians who don't have a sound mind. they got a sound heart. A heart that's given over to God. There's victory. There is victory. Don't give up. Keep going. Strive forward. Grow on. I said grow on. Go in all the world and preach the gospel. Man, that's what you need to do. You need to give that gospel to somebody else.